atrial fibrillation is probably the commonest heart rhythm disorder that needs to be treated. It's said that one in four of us will actually get it at some point during our lives. And it's something which one has to take quite seriously. You could say that um, a lot of the problems that happen with the heart are effectively plumbing problems. They're to do with blockages in pipes and arteries, narrow valves, leaking valves. But atrial fibrillation is different. Atrial fibrillation is an electrics problem with the heart. And if we think of each heartbeat, it's like um, a, a regular electrical wave that spreads down from the top chambers of the heart to the bottom chambers of the heart. And as it spreads, it makes the muscle of the chambers contract in a smooth, regular, coordinated way. First the top chambers and then the bottom chambers. And in atrial fibrillation, what happens is a bit like if you see a stream of water that's flowing smoothly and suddenly the turbulence starts to increase and it breaks up into little whirls and eddies colliding with each other and that's like the electrical waves that are going on in the top chambers of the heart and suddenly there's no smooth coordinated pattern to it and so the heart muscle is just wriggling and writhing around and not actually managing to make any contraction uh, and worse than that it's sending these electrical impulses in a very chaotic fast irregular way down to those main pumping chambers the bottom chambers which are then struggling to try and pump the blood off around the body so it's an electrical problem with the heart which makes the heart as a pump work a lot less efficiently atrial fibrillation is usually sensed by most people as palpitations as the feeling of the heart uh, fluttering or beating just irregularly, fast, uncomfortably in the chest. Some people say it's like feeling I've got a butterfly trapped in, inside my chest fluttering around. Um, it can at times produce quite uncomfortable sensations if it's racing fast, um, like lightheadedness or even faintness, uh, chest discomfort or even chest pain. And nearly always there's a sense of struggling to get a proper deep breath and a feeling of breathlessness. And if you're actually walking or maybe even running or jogging when it first comes on, uh, it really feels as though the plug's been pulled out of the, uh, the machine. As, you, as you're trying to get the energy to uh, run up that slope, it's suddenly like all that energy has been drained out of you. And most people will sense this uh, sensation and realize that their heart is beating in, a, in an abnormal way. But some people don't. Some people... Um, are really very unaware of the change in the heart rhythm. They just notice that suddenly they're a lot more uh, breathless and they're finding it much harder to get up hills than they were before. And it may not be until they uh, say take their pulse or somebody notices that their heart's beating irregularly that they, they realize the symptoms are due to an irregular heart rhythm. It's not necessary to visit a doctor if you just feel a transient slight irregularity of the heart rhythm. We all get the odd beat during the course of the day when you might just suddenly feel, oh, there was a little missed beat there or felt a little extra beat. So that uh, on its own isn't atrial fibrillation and it's something that we feel universally. But if you have um, irregular, uh, especially if they're fast beats, uh, for five or ten minutes or more continuously, then usually something is abnormal and that's the type of signal that you should be thinking about going to see a doctor. And of course quite a few people now can take their pulse um, and so if you can take your own pulse then you may be able to check the heart rate and if you find that it's going at 90, 110, 120 beats per minute and that's going on continuously for around uh, uh, five minutes or more, then that's going to be abnormal if you're just sitting down resting quietly and that should be checked out and of course quite a lot of people now will have things like Fitbits or home blood pressure machines and they may well see that suddenly their readings that they're getting on those have, have changed and that they're seeing faster rhythms and sometimes it'll even be flagged up the more sophisticated types of monitoring like Apple watches and things that are available these days will quite often tell you that it thinks you're having atrial fibrillation. So I'm getting quite used to seeing patients coming along and, and, and bringing some evidence with them. 
Um, and that's very helpful because what the doctor is really going to need when he is trying to make the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation is ideally an ECG that's recorded at the time that the symptoms are being felt. Um, so some of these little recording devices, I've got a little thing here, this is used very often, a little cardia device that has uh, little metal plates and uh, will Bluetooth through to your phone and actually record an ECG onto your phone. There are all sorts of devices now that are coming out uh, that are quite useful and, and the more information you can collect for the doctor when you see him, the better. There are probably three main areas of risk uh, related to atrial fibrillation. The, the worst is that it increases the risk that blood clots can form in the top chambers of the heart. And if they fly off and go into the circulation and go up to the brain, for instance, they can cause a stroke. Uh, so once atrial fibrillation uh, has set in, this is something that you have to assess what the level of risk for the individual patient is. Now, a completely fit and well young patient with nothing else wrong with them has a very, very low risk of any clots forming and of a stroke happening. But if you have uh, diabetes, heart failure in the past, or uh, even a previous stroke maybe, there are a number of risk factors. High blood pressure is another one that uh, increase the chances that you could suffer something as serious as that. Also, if atrial fibrillation is left untreated for quite a long time, if you are in it constantly with the heart racing, say for a few weeks, then very often the heart muscle will weaken and you will go into heart failure. The heart will just begin not to pump strongly at all. You'll be very breathless, develop swelling of the ankles, uh, all the features of, of heart failure. And the other risk is really that if left uh, too long from a, a patient who's just having short bouts of the atrial fibrillation, after a while it can progress into the more serious form where it's there constantly. Once it's, once it's there constantly and you're in atrial fibrillation all the time, it's called persistent atrial fibrillation, and it's much harder to treat. Essentially, the longer you're in atrial fibrillation, the harder it is to get rid of it. And even when we're talking about um, some of the things we'll mention in a moment, like the heart uh, procedures that can be done to try and knock out the bits of the heart that are provoking the atrial fibrillation. They work less well in patients who've been suffering from the atrial fibrillation for a long time. So it's important to get to your doctor and get that diagnosis. Uh, if you say have had severe chest pain or you've fainted or you've had a really marked response and you've had to go straight into the hospital, you may be in the emergency department and having the atrial fibrillation and an ECG may be done. And can I just say that if that happens, please ask the team to give you your own copy of the ECG, because that will be like gold dust for somebody like me who then is asked to see you. And maybe you're back in normal rhythm by that time. But if I have an ECG that's showing me the atrial fibrillation you are suffering from, it gives me a really good head start into working out what's the best way of treating you. Atrial fibrillation, when it was first studied quite a while back now, before really most of the treatments became available, was really associated with quite a severe change in the outlook for people. Essentially, it doubled the mortality so that uh, each year, whatever your risk was of death, heart attack, stroke that year, uh, it was doubled if you had atrial fibrillation compared to somebody just like you who didn't have atrial fibrillation. But even with all the treatments that uh, we now have available, there is still a roughly a 5% risk per year if you have atrial fibrillation uh, that you will suffer one of these really serious outcomes. So I'm afraid that the prognosis is always going to be poorer than for somebody who doesn't have atrial fibrillation. But we have seen in some of the recent trials, really quite recent, just reported in the last couple of years, that if you get on to treat people early and you do all the things that are designed to try and get them back into normal heart rhythm, so that may be giving them drugs or it may be going forward to one of the operative procedures that we do by passing tubes up from the blood vessel at the top of your leg and then traveling to the heart and inactivating the areas of the heart that cause the trouble, that's called a catheter ablation. 
uh, if you take these sorts of approaches, you can reduce the risks of the serious outcomes by at least 25%. And in fact, when you look at really serious outcomes like death, then you almost halve the risks if you take this approach of active early treatment. 